Uh, this is Carl. This is the reservoir department. Reservoir department. Uh, you make the, the I reservoirs. Make the, I make the reservoirs. Explain the process of building a reservoir. Uh, what do we have here? Well, we get a machine. <laughs> you go out and cut your materials, come back, and you have to uh, cut the corners and uh, dovetail them mm -hmm. and put the boxes together. Uh, these control the volume and pressure of the air between the blowers and the pipes. Okay, so the air comes in. The air comes in and it it's controlled by a curtain with the folds that allow it to go down. Inflate. And so as it inflates it pulls up that curtain. It pulls up the curtain and then stops the air. Stops the air. At the right level. Okay. Where you can see it. Hmm. And as you use air, the reservoir fills up, the top comes up. And as it does that, it pulls a rod which closes the curtain. And then as you use air, it opens the curtain back up. This doesn't appear to be a new uh, No, this is a new one. This is an old molar okay. that we're redoing. And we're patching in holes so you can see how we've got the holes patched in. It's being shipped out and it's going to go into a partially new organ. Okay. Very good, and it looks as good as new. The leather is all brand new and yeah, all replaced, leathers. So, okay. This was this was this wasn't done by us. Oh uh, really? It, it was been done in the last five years. Okay. So they decided not to. So you didn't you didn't have to replace it. No, it's still the, good. The leather will last anywhere from twenty years to forty or fifty okay, years. So five years old is nothing on yeah. these. All right. Folds. This is an example of the, of the folds. At uh, and that's cotton fiber on the back and leather that's an inch and three quarters wide, that's goat skin. These are shade frames that open and close to control the volume of the pipe organ. The pipes are back behind here, or back behind this side. This is the trace arm and the dogs. These are made with aluminum and uh, Blocks of solid blocks of wood with soundboard I think on the I inside, go and those work on as many as 15 of them together to work that many shades. They used to use wood, but aluminum is <laughs> easier to work with, and it's lighter. This is Jamie Duran. You are the Foreman, chest, or the director of the chest department here. Right here. Um, so you're responsible for making all the wind chests. Uh, we've seen how they're designed and laid out, and you actually get large pieces of paper to physically map the pipes. Uh, and tell me about the process of building the chest from there. Okay, so once we have the pipe hole centers laid out, uh, we'll go to the drill press and we'll start drilling the pipe holes. And we'll drill the channels <laughs> that connect the Pouch board to the front. Yeah. Let's talk about the action a little bit. It's a little complicated if you've never it seen is. this before. So we have the pipe here that goes to get the air in. So this is underneath, and uh, when it deflates, then the air can get in. So walk me through the process. Sure. It's all a difference between chest pressure and atmospheric pressure. So when the note the key is pressed on the keyboard. It, it opens a, a valve on the bug. I'm not really seen, but it's here. So, okay. Anyway, and so that opens the channel up to atmospheric pressure. These channels. These channels. And so then the wind pressure pushes on the leather because it's now a greater pressure inside the chest. So these, these channels connect. Okay. Yes, the channels so on the pouch board. We have atmospheric pressure. Organ pressure pushes down. Yeah, it seems simple, yeah, even though there's a lot of complicated little parts to get it there. Right. And so then when you release the key, it reverses, and the, the valve changes position and lets chest pressure come back in, and the pressure equalizes and the spring yeah, pushes, a spring under there, actually. Yeah, the spring pushes the pouch back up. It's good to see this in a big pedal chest. It's really yeah. obvious, because these get very small. They do. When you get to have trouble. So. Um, and then all of those are put together here in this department. You have people that actually have to assemble the fill or whatever. Yes. Yeah, we make all of our pouches. Yeah. So what other, besides this style of chest, do you make other right. electromechanical or things like that? Uh, right. The, our Pittman chest is kind of our other big chest that we make. And the 
advantage to the Pittman chest is you can have multiple ranks of pipes on one set of switching, so you only have to buy one set of magnets, and you can run eight or ten sets of pipes off of them. Um, so we build those quite a bit. The unit chests are flexible, you can play with more than one pitch from more than one division. That's good, that's what this and that's is. what this is. So, so one magnet, one note. Right. So you can move into I see. Variations on the same style of chest. Correct. Very good. That's the main chest that we build. Now, um, how do you test these? I mean, once you've got them all together, what's the next step? So once we get the chests built, they go through finish, through handwork, get the pouches put on, then they go into the assembly room, we wire them, and then fully assemble them, put them under wind, and test them out. And say something doesn't work, what's usually, what, what's a point where they might be the fault that you have to go back and test? Once in a while, you'll forget to punch a, a channel out mm -hmm. so that it's not connected. Uh, valve adjustment, or, uh, bad solder connection on a magnet, or something like that. It's, so it's usually a fairly. This has a layer of paper over it, so you can somebody maybe forgets. Yeah, occasionally you forget to punch one. Oh, that's understandable. All right. Uh, it seems very a very reliable, simple method. Once you've got everything in place. It really is. Yeah. Uh, we're in the finishing department here at Reuter, and this is. Tony. Tony. Tony, you're in charge of all the finishing, all the woodwork, and. Yes, I make sure all the. Uh, uh, when the pieces come in, they're stained and, and cleared and look really nice when I'm done. With it. Very good. Yeah. Um, and it all has to be done by hand. I mean, as you're all yes. doing it. Now, yes. you do have spray booths, I assume, and that's we for. Got a spray booth, and that's where I shoot all my clear stuff and mm -hmm. make it make the shine happen over there. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, and that's all done. It's, it's really nice. I would say finishing yeah. includes pipes as well, too, right? So you yes. spray some of the pipes, yes. and so yes. uh, everything comes through here at well, some point or another mm -hmm. uh, if sure. it's going to end up in the organ. And you have large, nice, modern spray booth with vents. Uh, works really well. Yeah. It, it works really well. It keeps everything in there in that one area. So yeah, we like it. Yeah. This is John Beshin, supervisor of the voicing department here at Reuter. Uh, this is a fantastic space you've got here. Tell me about how this is all set up in this room. Well, the original thought when uh, they built the facility is that uh, materials would enter on one end and the finished product would exit on the opposite end. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of still laid out that way. Uh, when the pipes come from the pipe shop, uh, they will need their tuning system. We usually call it slides, but it also involve caps and other types of things too. So if we have to put slots in or things like that. Uh, originally, we had, uh, of course, you know, when you first start out, you have kind of a, a vision how you want it to be, but then over time in, getting, in using it, you kind of change your mind about things. So you can see on the floor where the, the mats were that you'd stand on, of course they, they left all the adhesive, <laughs> so you can see where they were. So we had the slider originally here, and it was kind of cramped, and we had patterns and things on the wall there where the holes are yet. But uh, we decided that that didn't work out as well, especially access to the different voicing rooms was kind of difficult. So we put it in the center of the room. I see. And so we have uh, flu voicing rooms over here. Yes, right? we have flu basically on this end, and we have two rooms. Yeah, uh, so reeds are on the, the south end, and so one and two okay. are dedicated to uh, just doing flu pipes. So we have stacks of pipes here that most of these are, are in, in for a job that's coming up. They're yes. ready to be voiced. I see they each have a number uh, indicating yes, the job so, number. Yes, uh -huh. So we have a number of, um, so that would be the opus number. Um, 2627. So these would be mostly uh, spotted metal pipes, or mm -hmm. those that are five feet or shorter would be in trays. And then the eight foot bases and et cetera no. typically would be uh, stored along the wall. Like okay. That. So the, the tuning apparatus, or the, we call it the slide in this case, uh, we would make looks like this on the end of the pipe. So basically, what you're doing is adjusting the vibrating air column, the length of that that's inside of this tube that we call the body. So the, the farther away you go from down here, the longer you make it, the lower in pitch, and to make it shorter, as you go shorter, it raises the pitch. So that's uh, what that particular thing is. So it's an, an adjustable part to be able to tune. The other area I'm mostly concerned with is uh, the mouth area. And so that looks like that. Depending on uh, the pipe and et cetera, of course it has its upper lip, lower lip, and then these two pieces of metal on, other, on either side are the ears, and then the, the horizontal piece is called the languid. 
and that uh, fits uh, all the way, uh, divides the foot from the body. Uh, has a, a bevel on the front side of it, and from builder to builder uh, that will vary. I believe, I think ours is uh, 65 degrees. I think that sounds right. And then, uh, so the only area then that the air would, would enter through is this little narrow slit between the languid and the lower lip, and I can kind of demonstrate by poking this in there. And we call that the flue, or wind wave. So that's why we call all these type of pipes flue pipes, because of that uh, particular feature. Another thing you can think about these pipes is uh, they're basically just whistles because they work on edge tone. So as the air comes up through the flue and strikes the upper lip, uh, it causes the, vol or the column of air in the body uh, to begin to vibrate. Positioning that air stream is, of course, dependent on the languid by uh, lowering or raising it uh, determines how much air goes into the pipe. So as you lower the languid because of the bevel, it will draw air into the pipe or, and vice versa by, by having it um, higher. And of course, how much air you give the pipe is uh, determined by the toe hole at, at the, the foot of the pipe. We call this the toe, I think the British call this the tip, so, but it's all kind of the same thing. So we regulate uh, in various par uh, parts. So this is not what we call open toe voicing. So this has, has a form toe from the metal itself. Uh, bigger pipes will have a cast lead toe uh, that are heavier. So this is a 16-foot set, and uh, let me actually grab a bigger pipe and indicate. So we need 4-foot C, which from 16-foot <coughs> is no, tw uh, 25, and uh, indicates it's a quarter. And I have a set of uh, proportional dividers. I tell people it's basically a lopsided teeter-totter, like you find on the playground. So I can adjust the pivot point up or down on this, and that changes uh, the proportion from this end to that end. And I've got a place on here. Now, <coughs> the sheet indicates it's a quarter or a fourth. So I set it on four. And what that is doing is the distance. I measure the distance between the two ears, or, that's, or, or the flattening, if it doesn't have ears. And then that's its mouth width. So if I'm sitting on a quarter, uh, the distance between the lower lip and the upper lip will be one fourth of what the, the distance across is. So I just take that, open up this side, put it on like that, and then carefully so you don't change the setting. And then you scribe across. Uh, the metal, they use a little line, and then usually with a knife like this. And one thing about voicing tools, you don't just go to the hardware store and uh, say, well, I need some voicing tools for flue pipes. <laughs> a lot of these uh, are made here in the shop or custom made, and some of them are common materials. Uh, this is a, a pallet knife. Uh, we have lip hooks. You can use these for other things too. Uh, but we have to make these. Uh, some of these things, there are some supply places that you could buy. From. Uh, this is just a, a jeweler's hammer. Uh, we have a, a foot hook, I guess we'll call it, uh, that's just made out of a steel rod that was shaped and bent, etc. So between the, the bigger one here and the smaller ones, I probably use the most. So with this, I just kind of get it started, and uh, you shave uh, back and forth, cross it, until you uh, reach that line. And then you can also double check your work to make sure you don't have a, so you want to be easy when you're doing this, so you don't, and then you should take out smaller pieces at a time instead of one big swipe. <laughs> um, and uh, so you just make sure it's nice and level. So typically cut-ups in, in the organ pipes are level or, or parallel. The, the lower lip and the upper lip should be parallel. Now sometimes we have what we call an arch where it's higher in the middle. So that would be an instance where we would do that. And then these particular pipes, uh, we put a bevel on the upper lip. We call it a skive. And I uh, will just uh, scrape across. Now, some people will actually cut, uh, but I always find that being kind of dangerous because usually you take out big chunks or gouges that you don't really intend to do. So, so I just scrape across it, and then this other side is kind of sharp, so if there's some little pieces of metal left behind, I can clean those out of the corner. 
And then depending on how much pressure and how thick the metal is, usually I go through and kind of redress it up again. And then uh, by that point, then, it is ready to go out what we call the uh, voice ignition. Usually uh, an organ in itself, it has all the basic components uh, that you would find in a pipe organ, except uh, expression, such as those swell sheets, but it has, I guess, the other four. So you have a blower, which is isolated again for, uh, for sound, and there's a rectifier uh, for power. Uh, that goes then into an air regulator that we call a reservoir. I can set the pressure on that by either springs and weights, uh, usually both. Typical operating pressures are about an eighth of a PSI, so on a, on a wind gauge or a manometer. I have the old-fashioned water kind here, but there's a lot of digital varieties now. Uh, there's two columns of water, and when you apply air pressure at the bottom, uh, you measure the displacement between the two columns of water, and then that usually we do things in inches, but you can do it in metric, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if we're after three inches, the distance between this column and that column would be three inches apart. So that tells you that you're on two inches of weight pressure. And typical um, organ pressures are probably uh, usually between three or four inches. So anyway, we, uh, we set the uh, air pressure. We talked about, okay, so that's a second device. Uh, the wind chest, this one uh, so I can, has all the valves in it that I control from the fourth thing, uh, the keyboard. And I, this one has various rows on it. Uh, I think it's got five. Uh, the set of pipes that, that are in the back is my acoustic reference. So that stay, that's actually part of the voicing machine. And I use that as my uh, tuning reference. So, so those pipes stay here. And that's a, a four-foot principle back there. And the bigger pipes that don't fit on this, I have a, an offset chest here of, of 12 notes that we can uh, put the eight-foot bass on, let's say. Things usually work in a progression, and a lot of it is, is very logical. So as you're going down, getting bigger, you would anticipate that these total hole sizes would be getting a little bit bigger as well. So I have uh, several things here to use for that. So I can use this as a gauge. It's just a jeweler's ring sizer. And uh, we have uh, some bigger ones yet than this if need be. But this usually covers about everything, uh, except for the really small ones. Uh, so if we're doing like uh, little mixture pipes or upper ends of tierces and uh, quince and all that, these, these are just uh, little stopper handles from wood pipes, and we've, they're uh, sewing needles. <laughs> and the amount of air the pipe uh, requires is dependent on various factors, the mouth width, uh, the cut-up uh, variations, flu width, and things like that. Uh, also, if there's any uh, the scale difference, the scale is just its diameter in relation uh, to its length. This is the uh, reed portion of the voicing department here at Reuter. This is Sean, he's in charge of the reeds. Uh, tell us here, you, you make every part of the reed pipe here. We do. So um, tell so me about some of the tools you've got here. Okay, so when we get them from the pipe shop, they have, you know, it's all soldered up and everything. And so they make the blocks that are solid in the pipe shop. Yeah, they're cast, and it's a high lead content. And this is the rough casting. Oh. First thing we do, we, we don't worry about this right away. We, we determine and we have a schedule what our shallots are going to be. And um, these are oboe shallots. They start out as uh, blanks, just a piece of brass. And then we take them over, we have a press over there that forms them to this point. And then we have to use a series of mandrels, which are actually back there. We have some forms, and we physically shape them. Similar to the tube. way they shape the pipes. The metal's just rounded and shaped. Exactly. Okay. Except and it's not as malleable. Right. Brass is a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put a cap on the end. Of yeah, and that's just square blank pieces that we solder on with the torch. Okay. And then we have to shape it on the grinder over there. Put a facing into it. We have additional manuals to open this up because we have a scale for our own okay. It's got to be specific size and shape. Right, and we have to measure each one. And then once that's done, we'll grind the face flat. Um, keeping it even is important. And we do that with the grinder, and then we use a series of files and very fine sandpaper. It has to be 
perfectly flat. If there's a high or low spot, you'll hear it in the pipe, but it's hard to see. So it's very important that this is perfectly flat. And then we have uh, our mark for our set in, how deep we make it. And so then what we do with these is this is you know rough opening here. We have to cut this off, this piece of metal. Just use a hand saw for that. And then we have this machine right here. Um, we actually had a guy who worked for us at one time built this. He was a machinist. And we have uh, some reamers based on which which set we're doing. And put it in the drill and just continuously open the hole until the shallot drops down just at or beyond that. Um, the hole is tapered by the shallot. Yeah, and that's the all of these all of these reamers are tapered because this is not. So once you get it into that set in point, then is good and the next thing you have to do is um, mark your, or set your wet okay so this just and this was also made by our uh, former employee was a machinist this sets in perfectly square and we have some plates that are different sizes that are fit to our blocks all of our blocks are standard for us so you measure it and this fits in here and it holds it level and square tighten these down and move it if you have to and then this secures it and then we have our cutters and we have a schedule for the, the cut that we're going to make this fits in here this is all uh, precision stuff I'm really impressed with how this is done. And once this is in and secure, and you have it lined up side to side, front and back, all you do is pull that down, and it'll cut your wedge. So that cuts out both the, 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 the square, angle for yeah. the wedge that's going to hold the shot in place. Exactly. And, of course, these are all different widths that are our standard. And so we have um, wood that we use for, we use wooden wedges here. Um, but we're looking for um, the face of the wedge where it meets right here. When it's pounded in, you want to see most of it covered with the gray from the, mm -hmm. from the lead. And that'll tell you that it's snug and secure. So when you take it out, you can see that it rubbed and it's completely yeah. fine. Exactly. That. And then we cut a little notch in it. We have a, a gauge over there, uh, a little notch in the wedge so that you know you know where it's set in at and that's also your uh, removal so you can pry that when you take it apart yep. uh, and then the reed wires do you make those or just we do we have a series of jigs we have uh, brass stocks they have a machine area that uh, we just cut them to a certain length and we have a series of four j uh, bending jigs that we use to make them and we keep our sizes right over there We're here in, this is the assembly room of the Reuter Organ Company, uh, and that's your, your head of, of console construction, right. and, and uh, George, you're in charge of putting consoles all together, correct? Yes, yeah. So, uh, well, tell us what happens here in this room. How, does, how do things finally come together? Tell so me. I'll start out by, by saying the console is built in a different area of the building, okay. and then once it's completed, completed, it is brought in here with the rest of the organ, mm -hmm. the organ chamber. And this is where they put the final test on making sure all the switches in the console are functioning correctly. Okay. And in order to get to that point, we have to put switches in pretty much every component on the console. Okay. And part of that is building the keys. And George is in charge of making sure the keys are made here and function correctly to a predetermined uh, weight. Of right. The the other, well, that was something I was going to point out. Um, every part of the console, say maybe the draw knobs and the electronics, are made here in the shop. The keyboards are all mm -hmm. completely right. Reuter made. Yes. A lot of companies don't do that anymore. Um, so uh, tell us about a little bit about the keys. If you well, our keyboards are made out of basswood, uh, and they're all made out of basswood. 
It's uh, and uh, they are, and the customer determines on the surface what they are, whether they're plastic or bone or a specialty wood like ebony. We start out with a blank, which is a large, larger than this piece, mm -hmm. and we go through a different series of steps of drilling different holes for pins, different holes for the front bushing, what we call where the this this key is actually riding on a little pin in there where it's felted and it rides up and down that. So all those holes from the back of the keyboard to the front part of the keyboard are all drilled all the same time. All the blanks are done the same time. And then, that, then they determine, oh, this customer wants bone and uh, ebony for keys. So for uh, things like the bone, do you actually get the raw material and you have to cut it raw, to shape? Yeah, we get one from Rhode Island and uh, we have to we have to kind of more or less inlay them. We have to we have to put them together and and uh, sand them so they're a nice butt joint and clean and then we route the edges and then they're all done individually a really time consuming individual <laughs> per key wow. is really done so this is not one of the, these are this was done in the 890s oh, okay by uh, a, a man that uh, his name was Gilbert Stone he had <laughs> worked here for 50 years but he he taught me how to make keys Okay. And so I sort of like uh, went on from there. These plastic ones don't need to shape, but you have to shape them. You have to do all the curve, that the, mm -hmm. the round overs, and they all have to be the same. This this overhang all has to be the same. Wow. We finally get them all together, and we put them on the keyboard, and they all uh, have to be have uh, different kind of contacts for them to, for the to work to send the signal out mm -hmm. to the to the to the computer, and we. We, we've got these different kind of contacts that so and they all have to fire exactly the same time when this one comes down and sends down that signal this one has to come down exactly so and then they have to have to have the same kind of feel we run through a different variety of things where we have them stay up with four ounces this is we try to do a thing mm -hmm. called a tracker touch mm -hmm. and which there, there's this little bit of resistance at the very first and then it'll just open up and fall so it's called a tracker touch, touch and we have to uh, uh, usually we adjust them twice. We, we, we uh, each one has to be adjusted and the height has to be adjusted. It's got screws for that. And then uh, we let it set and we have a little uh, machine that simulates a year and then we do that and then we do it all over again to try to work in the spring so they're, they're well they're well used. The but there's a lot of felt involved. Yeah. So, they, so what do you mean by simulating a year? What is they, they'll, they'll go up and it's down. It's an actual machine that yeah, presses the keys yeah, they'll, for... They'll go up and down, up and down uh, for a certain amount of hours. And uh, that, uh, that sort of works in the springs and the felt because there's a lot of felt that's, that's here that's, that's uh, pushing down. That's, that's why it's not clanking because there's felt hitting another board down there. And so those get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and then 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 the surf then these aren't as level anymore. Mm, so we got to re-level them and re them. So they're kind of we try to kind of work out the kinks before they're on the road, and then a year later, oh, we need to go back and work on some keys. It kind of sort sure. of uh, cuts that time down. You, know? you said there's different kinds of contacts. What are the different kinds of contacts on the well, keys? Well, there's an optic rail we have. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an it's actual beam of light that's yes. making the contact. and uh, that's a fairly new system. This is an old system. This was done, so we used the old contacts from there. It was like a, a copper wiper that, that comes down and hits a silver mm. sprung spring, uh, and that's attached to the wire that sends it to the computer, and then and that has an adjustment for the height. So you got to make sure the contact, even if the key goes down, right? The contact's contact got to hit. hit. Exactly. Yeah, the contact has to hit right there too. Wow, wow. And the firing depth, you know, the, these all all the keys at the come down and uh, and the depth is the halfway in between if I recall. Somewhere around right halfway, now. just maybe a little shy of half. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of work in just making sure the yeah, keys only keys. look nice, but yeah. they actually function like yeah, they're they supposed function, to. Yeah, they function and uh, there's no, um, there can, things could happen where there's something, is some piece of, some of the old ones, you know, they start to warp but mm -hmm. we have to get them to fix, we have to work on them and uh, different things could happen in which there's a noise. One's making a noise. We have to figure out why one's making a noise and the other one's not. Yeah. Made the same time, but it's somehow making a clicking noise. And we have to figure <laughs> out that, you know. So, you know, so, so when you do that twice, you usually find the problem keys. There's always some. Sometimes there's always problem keys. So, Jeff, now we're looking inside the back of this console. This is a 
a rebuild. It's an organ that's come back and it's being redone with all modern electronic. What are we looking at in here? These are the circuit cards that all the keys and the switching, draw knobs, tilting tabs, stop keys, depends on what style it is. All those are electronic and they have to be wired into a series of cards. Each one of these cards represents what's in the console. Mm. Over here we have keys, and we have our draw knobs and pistons. And then we have another card that's called a driver. And that's actually what makes the stop move when you call for it. Oh, it fires the magnets to yes. push them in and out, right. okay. Right, so all this together is the brain or the CPU or the however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. Then this brain talks to the chamber through a fiber cable on this system. Just that one tiny little this cable. This one right here. <laughs> it goes out to the chamber into a series of similar cards. And they all talk to each other through the fiber optics. Wow. And so we don't have to have a big cable like they did in the old days. You used to have one wire for every key and every stop. Correct. And sometimes the combination action magnets Correct. and maybe some spares yes. in the power. So yeah, right. we're used to big, huge cables. And now it's just this tiny so little we have this thin wire. Wow. One thin wire plugged into the um, to the wall. And that's all it takes. This and is, you're, you're, you're good to go. And this is the power supply that this, this makes it all run. So, this is okay. a power supply that we use now. Mm -hmm. This is an older one and it had a good power supply. So we reused it. Oh, okay. So and this is just temporary. The, the nowadays power supplies that we're using are slightly different, but they do the same thing. Okay. And so now we, you've got it all hooked up and they're testing and making sure every pipe and every valve works and, and every control in the console works. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what we do in a different area. We test it out there mm -hmm. and we bring it in here to make sure our test out there was correct. Mm -hmm. And if they're playing the wrong pitch or something, we'll have to reprogram it. Yeah. And this system is totally programmable also oh wow okay so if you did if you needed a 12 notes here and there and so on that's you can go back in and program it, Move to, it somewhere else. to the desired spec uh, all very modern and it, it seems uh small it seems like there's not a lot of a lot of cards here in, in the old this days stuff. this was all full of switching yeah right clear to the top <laughs> all the way down to the bottom we're, we're now with the electronic shoe potentiometers mm -hmm. um versus the the old kind had Whole bunch of switches sticking out that would make contacts mm -hmm. and you would have to send that signal but all these signals go to one central okay. processing unit and then it goes through fiber on a binary code i want to look at those shoe potentiometers sure. for a minute. the the guy that that sells the system mm -hmm. recommended these potentiometers okay so how do these work what are these what are these doing when you mm -hmm. so what you do you have three shoes one is a crescendo which mm -hmm. adds stops electronically the other two are control the volume of the shades mm -hmm. or the volume of of this the sound mm -hmm. let's say the music um when you push this down it's going to open the shades so it's, it's got and as i go of... down it's sending an electronic signal to the computer that says more power so it's or just that, that thin wire the position of that is what yes. it's kind of like a volume control on a Correct. radio this, it's just changing the, the volume sending yeah. it and so it yeah. knows where the position of the shoe is and then we can program the shades to open and Based make on that. the volume louder per uh, division. Yeah, it's it, it's the, just small and on. compact and looks uh, really nice. Is that? It's just a little thin wire there. <laughs> it's it's actually a cable. Or is it? Okay. Um, these so it's are stiff. Come from the aircraft industry. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. All right. Uh, when we buy the system, we say we need three pots. Okay. okay? Hmm. Potentiometers and and then we wire them and it it is programmed. It comes out. Uh, very generic, and you have to program it according to mm -hmm. which how many stages you have on the volume. Let's see. Okay. So yeah, but aircraft controls inside the organ console. People always talk about organ consoles looking like air cockpit. airplane cockpits, okay. and here's there's actually the same kind of little parts in now, them. I was going to refer to that. Yeah. <laughs> the Rotor Organ Company has an option of a MIDI. It's called Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Uh, then you can add musical sounds through a sequencer through MIDI. You can also do some programming. We have a USB port uh, available for memory sticks so that the organists can take all their memories with them and when they come back, they stick it they in, got and boom, they've got their memories back. Pretty much it, every, every organ nowadays has that kind of memory and MIDI interface, even if we don't even see it active on the I think that's console, right. yeah. these control yeah. systems are because it's a computer that's inside this. That's right. So talking to another computerized right. instrument. Yeah. That's something people don't realize about pipe organs is there, there's still pipes, but there's a computer in between and you can yeah. you can do all sorts of interface exactly. with it. And, so. and that's why we have an option uh, to to be able to talk to MIDI. Yeah, very okay. handy. All right. This is the chamber panel. This is where the signal from the console comes. 
And once it gets here, it knows which one of these wires to play on a binary code system. So each one of these cards represents a, a code. And when you press that note that's programmed to play that wire, this is, this is where it all happens. Then these are all wired into the chess. And that's how it works. Um, this is temporarily hooked up on site here in, in our shop. But when it gets out into the chamber, this will all be cleaned up and, and, and wired to nice and neat. And this looks like, I mean, it's the same kind of cards as we saw on the console. It's just the other end. It's exactly, fiber optic in, exactly the same card. signals out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And these are what we call driver cards because they're driving a magnet. Okay. The mm -hmm. console has different kind of cards because they want to sense an input. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so these driver cards, they're, they're really, really good because you can just swap one out and know where you're at. Okay. And it looks like I see automotive fuses in here. That's correct. These are the same this kind is, of fuses as cars. If you think about it, a car is 12 volts DC. Mm -hmm. All our rectifiers rectify the voltage down to 12 volt DC. So that's what we're using is that type of fuse right now. Um, in the old days, when I first started driving, we had those long one and, in, one and a quarter inch fuses. We were using those just up until recently in the last, let's say 10 years. Recent in pipe organ can be <laughs> a little bit different. But uh, so I, I, I re we really like using these. Um, each one of these rows represents a card. So it's uh, a lot easier to test out and figure out what's, what's wrong, if there is a problem. This is Ron Krebs, your Vice President of the Reuter Organ Company. How long have you been in that position? It's been about 12 years now. Okay. And we're in the break room. Wouldn't think it would be the most interesting spot in the shop. And it's a nice break room, but there are two pipe organs here, and I thought we'd take a look at them. Um, tell me about this instrument that uh, we're sitting at here. Well, this was originally a residence organ. Uh, it's um, made for a residence in Wichita, Kansas. Okay. And I think about 1994. Oh, really? And it's uh, tracker action. It's, it's mechanical a mechanical action. Reuter mechanical action organ. We don't see many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there was um, some conversation with Pete Visser when okay. he first came up with this design, and one of our engineers went down there and visited him, and see. he's very open about um, <laughs> sharing his knowledge. And this is this is the result. A design yeah. that um, is certainly Reuter, but inspired by yeah that session. Well, do we, how many mechanical action organs has Reuter built? Do we know of, or are there? I, I don't really know. Yeah, a there's, there's not many. There's I mean, not a lot. Every once in a while, there's a smaller instrument like this that comes up on the Imagine they, they, they must be, yeah, if they're not going to mm -hmm. be too big. Well, it's a, it's a neat little instrument with the slider stop action, and uh, yeah, um, all very compact, and, and in here in the break room where yes. we can come practice during mm -hmm. lunch or, you know. <laughs> It's, uh, yes, this is, <laughs> I think of these as my personal practice instruments, this one and the one next, right. uh, depending on my mood. I, I, it's nice to be able to choose. And, well, uh, tell us a little bit about this one, about this other. Where did well, it come from? Uh, uh, it's always easy to talk with some photo illustrations. Oh. Uh, this instrument was actually installed at uh, St. Paul's Lutheran mm. in a uh, collegiate campus church. Okay. And, um, they decided to get this organ, which was a Reuter originally installed in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Oh. So when this one came out, I see. This, this one is, came this out. One came this out. was installed. I see. Um, so they're both nicely went into the space, but this is yeah. just a little more generous than the other one. Was. And and we're saying both of these organs are available uh, yes, immediately. Should um, anyone be they interested? Would be. Um, <laughs> and in the case of the tracker, this is what it looked like oh. um, in its original installation in the music room in Wichita. You'll notice the owner's oh, harpsichord the there. There was also a <laughs> grand piano here. It's of course, quite a room. Right. I never visited the place. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but um, I think it was a yeah. special installation. It's a nice little yeah design right yeah. for that little space. It works. And he well. had this Alco, so the tracker doesn't have sides. Okay. If we wanted to offer it with a case. Oh, um, okay. There might be a concept, something like this, or whatever you would happen to want. I mean, this okay. instrument was from 1967. Okay. I'm just checking to make sure. Um, it's Opus 1618. Uh, it's married with a different console that oh, we the, had. This isn't the original console? This is okay. not the original console. Uh, so 
the console is 1563, and I think that was from Oklahoma City. So it gets two Opus numbers there. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, just to keep things interesting. <laughs> So we're in the assembly room here at the Reuter Organ Company, uh, where there is an instrument going up that we've seen, but there are also two more uh, complete playing instruments in here that have been stored here. Ron, tell me about this one that we're sitting at here. So uh, this is a Reuter Theater organ from 1928, mm. uh, installed in the El Moro Theater. It was in uh, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, later, after it was no longer used as a theater, it went to a church, and then it was no longer used as a church and it came to us. Oh, wow. So it was in storage for a while <laughs> at the old building yeah. and um, we set it up here. And, and it's playing here where you can... Yeah, so, so it's ready to go. Quick we've rundown, got, how many ranks do we have and what are they? Okay, we've got five ranks on Just this five. instrument. Right. So there's tibia, concert flute, a string, the viol, uh, vox humana. On, I think it's all on 10 inches of wind. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit of it, okay. since it's all playing here. Sure.
lot of fun. <laughs> you didn't tell me there were bells in there too. That makes a nice yeah, little touch. Yeah, and all that's the remaining percussion, the bells, and there's a small set of chimes. Okay, and all that's from 1928 and still just all playing along in here. Yeah, tell me about this organ over here. Let's go over here and look at this one. So we also have this organ set up playing. Now this is, you told me earlier, not the original console. No. Same thing has happened there. Tell me about the, the organ and its pipes first. Yeah, the, the marriage of the console is just so it can play in the shop. Mm -hmm. um, this instrument was taken out of a church in the Kansas City area. Okay. And um, it's, again, a smaller size instrument, but it would be a good start for a division of oh, right. uh, vintage installation okay. and um, so consequently it has been re-leathered and that part's the mechanical part is ready to go Let's see and then we just put a console with it so that it can be played and if somebody wants to come in and hear it you can, can actually hear that and i see you've kind of adjusted the stop names to yeah. match what's actually there from what exactly. this console exactly and so. not everything on there is working over here or represented right. even over here so let's talk about this organ that we really want to come in here and it's the church it's in beulah michigan right. which is up uh, near traverse city i've been through there uh, tell me about the church the church is a wonderful wonderful building um, built right on the lake um, actually private lake or small inlet mm -hmm. lake right behind the church so that all the windows of the nave face that direction oh, and, and I can look out on the water and you look out on the water <laughs> and now you'll have a pipe organ superimposed over all of that. It should be very interesting to see. And then beyond that, it's like Michigan. Let's go look at it. You can tell me a little bit about this instrument. So this is the new organ for Beulah. Originally Opus 2165, installed in the church in Lakeland, Florida. And um, it's been readied and prepared, re-engineered for its new setting so up in it, Michigan. It's, it's had a number of pipes added to it. Yes, like a number the, of pipes added to it. And in this particular design, it will have uh, two enclosed divisions. The grate is enclosed oh, as okay. well the as this grade. well. That's good. And um, so that would be a main difference. And so it's set up here. It's We don't have every single pipe in the organ yet. We're still well, in the process. Um, when we put up instruments in the assembly room, we generally don't put the reeds in. Oh, OK. Uh, they're, brought in to be racked, et cetera, and, and then, then they go right back in their plastic bags yeah. so they can, don't get all dusty because this is, a, even with our very good air handling system and dust collectors. <laughs> still get some dust in yeah, there. Yeah, you still get some problems okay. that way. So the reeds are never in unless it's a special I see. Uh, so it's enough situation. that you can go through and, and play and make sure everything's yeah. uh, working. So this one's yeah. almost ready to go. Mm -hmm. We have a facade still that's being finished, I know. Right. And there's a, we saw some of the pipes being voiced that are still yeah. going to go in there. We probably saw a casework. Yeah, we saw a casework right sitting outside. So yeah. that'll be interesting to see all that. We've seen yeah. what it's supposed to look like. We've mm -hmm. seen the specs. So, and there's um, room for all that casework. It's all set up. So it'll all it be, be in still. Proportion, okay. So you can see what it's really going to be like in the room. Right. And that's yet to go. So. Well, we can't wait to see it in its place. We'll yeah. have to go visit Beulah, Michigan when this is done. So Ron and JR, thank you so much for letting us come in and see your shop in this wonderful factory that's uh, here in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, where you've built how many Royal Organs are there? What are your numbers? Oh, well, we're, what, 2,300 right now? Actually, it's 2,400. That's just the new one. The new that's one, not yeah. all the rebuild things that happened here, too. Probably. There's a whole lot of rebuilds. And yeah, another 5,000 Royals. It's a fantastic, uh, beautiful new shop. We probably only showed you maybe half of what we yeah. see here. Uh, there's so much, it's hard to, to get it all. We've been here all day, and we're the only ones left. Everyone else is gone, uh, and it's getting dark in there, so we're going to call it there. Uh, but again, thank you so much. And if you want to find out more about the Royal Organ Company, what's your website? RoyalOrgan.com. Come visit us. And thanks for being here. Indeed. And remember, for streaming classical organ music 24 hours a day, you can visit our three streaming stations, OrganLive.com, Positively Baroque, and The Organ Experience. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and click the thumbs up, and you can find out how to support us and make more videos happen on our website. Go to organ.media and click on support. Thanks for watching. See you next time.